Hello, everyone. Uh, tonight is uh, Jan June 27th. I'm happy to be here. This is actually, well, first, I'm on a new PC. So I hope uh, you see me the same way. It should be better. It's newer. And I uh, hope you hear me. Uh, this is going to be the last class, really, until I return uh, from my trips in August. So I do want to uh, wrap everything up. I, have, I, I grabbed everything that was on the floor of my office. I want to finish with that up, then we'll move on to uh, discussions of Geiger. It's the way I calculated, I probably need three more classes, maybe four, and then I'll be done this uh, unit on uh, reform, but that's going to have to wait. Before I go further, though, I want to say that this class is sponsored, not just this class, but the whole day of learning by Torah in Motion is sponsored by Joel Mandelbaum in memory of his father, by Bernard Mandelbaum. Um, Joel was with us uh, uh, throughout the Saul Lieberman classes as well and uh, taught me a good deal because he had a very close relationship, both him and his father, with uh, Shaul Lieberman. Uh, many of you probably know the name, uh, Bernard Mandelbaum. Uh, he wrote a good deal, was very active at the seminary. But in terms of scholarship, um, this is his major work of scholarship that is constantly referred to. It's uh, two volumes, his edition of the Psikta de Rav Kahana, uh, important midrashic work. So uh, if anyone's into midrash, you certainly uh, know this. And it, incidentally, it has uh, Shal Lieberman's uh, notes uh, in the back of volume two. So thank you very much uh, to the entire Mandelbaum family. Okay, let me just pick up with uh, quickly with all the piles I had, because I do want to get uh, uh, through with it. The first thing I want to show you is, and maybe we'll even go longer than normally, uh, uh, with the things I want to show you. I wanted to give you an example from last class that I mentioned of uh, lower criticism in Torah, that is in, in traditional Torah study. And uh, th I can give you numerous examples, but this is just one I find interesting because it appeared um, in the Torah journal of Rav Mazuz's uh, circle, uh, or Torah, and it's authored by Shmuel Ashkenazi, who, if you recall, uh, we spent a good deal of time speaking about because I was a recipient of a number of letters from him in uh, the semester, the few semesters that we dealt with uh, my book, Igros Machei Rabbanon. This is um, in uh, Vayikra, Leviticus, chapter 19. Take a look at um, verse Lama Gimel, 33. It says, V'chiyagori chager, if a stranger sojourn with you, ba'artzachem. Okay, so you got a problem here. Why does it say ger, singular, in an artzachem plural? It should be yavchiyagard ha ger ba'artzacha. And if you look at the orachayim on the spot, he gives uh, like a drush on this. If you look in Or Torah, Nisan, 1992, 5752, you have an article by Rav Shmuel Ashkenazi, and he says as follows. Now, again, I don't know if this is a thing you're going to go into yeshiva and mention this, but if you're interested in pshat, uh, this is important to know. He says that um, the version, look, our, our pasuk, we see it, it has bar tzachem, but the version of uh, bar tzacha appears, first of all, it appears in uh, the Gemara. If uh, it appears, in, that's the Gemara's version in Masachas Megillah. It appears in Ein Yaakov, Shmuel Ashkenazi says, and Ein Yaakov is known uh, for its very good uh, nuschaos. Um, it also appears in, uh, he says, um, where else, in the early Targum, in, in Unkos, if you look at the translation, it says Imchon, in uh, Targum Pseudo Jonathan. He says, this is the version that you'll have in the Septuagint and in the, the Syriac translation that's known as the Peshitta and the Vulgate. And uh, not only that, he says that um, if you look, there's the Kennicott edition of the Chumash, and also you have uh, uh, Ginsburg, uh, it, it, they cite manuscripts of the Torah. And he says there's uh, two manuscripts uh, <clears throat> in Kennicott de Rossi that have Esfem. The Samaritan version uh, has Etchem. Um, also, that's the, uh, hold on, um, he cites some more sources as well uh, here. Um, and also the Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi and Bikurim 
cites it as um, Artsachem. So what does Rabbi Shmuel Ashkenazi conclude? He says, Vadai lafi alacha shebeidenu, he means the Besefer Torah katsu vetchem, bim kol mitra, hareza Sefer Torah pasul. Obviously, if this Shabbos morning you read the Torah and you see that it says itchem, um, I'm sorry, if it says Artsachem, uh, Artsachem uh, instead of Artsachem, then um, Actually, I correct that. It, the, the early versions didn't have itcha, it had itchem. Sorry, that's what it means. V'chi agor itchem ger b'artzachem. He says, now, if you found a chumash that said it, uh, sorry, a Sefer Torah, the Sefer Torah would be puzzle. Why? Because we have to follow what's accepted. But then he says, however, ein mesora zo mechayeves es chazal. He says that this that uh, the Mesorah that we have to say itcha instead of itchem does not obligate Chazal. And we're not going to say, we, we don't correct the Balvin Yerushalmi because of the Mesorah. What Shmuel Ashkenazi says is that um, basically saying, if you want to know really the Pshat, why it says itcha, singular ger, ba'artzachem puro, the pshat really he's saying is because of the original version, the correct version is v'chiyakur itchem. However, uh, for whatever reason, the halacha has decided differently. And um, as he says, it's in the Bavli, it's in Yashami, it's in Yaakov, it's, that's the version that you have in the Samaritans and the basis for the different translations. So here you have something, I don't know what to say about this, other than here you have in a traditional Torah journal and a very traditional rabbi, mentioning this as uh, as pshat. Uh, does that mean, you, will you be thrown out of your local Beit Midrash if you say it? Probably. But uh, any, it certainly doesn't, it, it, this is not higher criticism, and it's not uh, the, the bad biblical criticism people speak about. And I, the fact is that if you're interested in pshat, you have to look at uh, other versions. And we do have some other versions. This is an example of uh, a different version that, uh, I mean, we can't deny the fact that it appears uh, in early Earlier sources, including in Torah manuscripts. So uh, that's what I mentioned last class I wanted to show you. Continuing, I wanted to mention something that uh, on my recent, oh, this I forgot to show you, and I see we have uh, David with us, so I don't know if David was with us last week, otherwise he would have certainly uh, corrected me, I think, uh, where I said about uh, Mazuz, so uh, Menachem, Ani Mazuz, I said I thought he, he was the um, the attorney general, but then I saw after class that uh, he actually was on the Supreme Court. So here's an example of someone from Jerba. Here's his father, Shlomo Mazuz, you know, a, a big, a relevant, posseg, author of many volumes, Shales and Shuvos. So this is what happens when you go to Israel. Uh, from Rabbi Shlomo Mazuz, you can become, uh, you know, Menachem Mazuz, um, very distinguished, but not really following in the... I, I, I don't know if he's Shomer Shabbos. I'm assuming not, but people can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, at least the way that I saw someone wrote about him, the impression is he was, isn't, but uh, it's not for me to uh, examine unless it's something public. But the point is that this is exactly what the people in Jerba were talking about, that uh, you come to Israel and um, it, things things change. Now, on the way back from uh, Jerba, I wanted to share another thing with you. I stopped in Paris because there's no direct flight. So I want to give you an example of something that because we're here in America, so many people assume something is in fact, halakhically, how it has to be. But if they were living in a place like France, they never would ha have this havamina. So what am I referring to? Well, if you go to my local show, all the local shows around here, pretty much all the shows I've been to in recent years, they're very careful that... Um, you dive in Mincha, and then you to, to wait to Meiriv, you wait till Shkia. You have to wait to Shkia. So much so that um, whenever we would have baseball games, for instance, and uh, the baseball games would start, let's say, 7 o'clock, and you can't, you, you, you want to dive in, so you dive in Mincha, and I always say, let's dive in Meiriv now, because after the game, it's dark, uh, that would be the best thing. And when on my trips, we dive in Mincha before dinner, and then we dive in Meiriv afterwards. But after the game, everyone's going, you can't do the minion. So I'm always saying, let's do Meirev. And there's always people there saying, how can we do Meirev here? It's not sunset yet. And if they were living in a place like France, where well, I picked it up from last week, as I'll show you, just um, 
sunset was 9.55 p.m. Well, everyone in France knows that you're davening Myriv before sunset. Uh, that's, uh, and uh, all you have to do is pick up our handy art scroll sitter here. And uh, in the back, uh, where it gives the halachot on page 1030, it talks about, you know, they have this stira, when, when can you start, uh, when does Mincha, time for Mincha end, when does Myriv uh, begin? But it says, so therefore, technically, if let's say sunset tonight is uh, 8.30, you're not supposed to daven 7 o'clock Mincha then Myriv. Quote, they say, this is according to Mishnah Bura, this prohibition applies only to an individual. A congregation is permitted to recite Mincha and Myriv in the same time period if it would be difficult or impossible to reassemble a minion later on. And that's how, if you lived anywhere where uh, it got sunset at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, you would know this. But being in America, I cannot tell you how many times there's always people challenging me. How can you dive in my riff now? And uh, then you have a guy who knows something who says, no, of course you can. But uh, that's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, I uh, Someone mentioned, and I got an email about this, about the one of the population of Warsaw. Um, if you look in the Tzadipi Judaic, the Jews there, I because I, I said that uh, Hirsch's point was that people, they're living not like in 19th century Germany, like 18th century Warsaw. So someone said, well, Vilna is a better example. And it is true. If you look in Tzadipi Judaic, the entry on Warsaw, you see, for instance, that in the 19th century, in 1816, Jews were almost 20% of the total. Uh, by um, 1864, Jews were 32% of the total population. And by uh, 1914, they were 38% of the population of Warsaw. That's a lot of Jews. However, the truth is that even in the, um, the end of the 19th century, Jews were 12% of the total population in uh, Warsaw. So by the end of the 19th century, you did have um, Jews coming in. There had to do with um, um, who, who was controlling uh, Warsaw um, at the time. Um, there was partitions of Poland, etc. So you can read all about it. Uh, Oh, I see I'm going to give me five more minutes here. Um, the abortion issue, which was decided by the Supreme Court. Uh, there was a mistake that we said last time, and I corresponded with the person who, uh, I think he was meant to quote the Chavo Siyari, not Ravak of Emden. Ravak of Emden, who holds yes. that um, a, a mamzer can be aborted, um, that uh, he doesn't mention only the first uh, 40 days. If you want more details, you can see Rabbi Blech's book on it. Uh, I had raised the question, why about the Rambam not mentioning you have to treat your teach your child um, a profession, and why why not? And uh, I actually remembered uh, correctly um, what uh, that uh, it was the Binyan Sion who actually says this. And uh, let me show this to you. He gives an answer. The Ravak of Etlinger he, um, he he cites a very interesting passage in the Rambam. I have it here. Here is in Hilchos Ritzeach. Um, Chapter 5, Halacha 5. It says that um, if a son unintentionally kills his father, he should be exiled. When a father unintentionally kills his son, he should be exiled. When does the above apply? It says, when the father kills his son while not in the midst of Torah study or when he was teaching his son a profession that is not necessary for him. But then it says, if, however, he imposes punishment on the son, let's say he hits his son while teaching him Torah, it says, Lambda Torah, or Chachma, or secular knowledge, or O umanut, or a profession, and the son dies, the father is not liable for exile. So what it's telling you here is that anything which is, um, like, a, it's a mitzvah to teach. If while you're teaching and trying to discipline your son, you accidentally kill him, you don't have to go into exile. The fact is, so here the Rambam, this is where we see that the Rambam acknowledges that uh, umnos, uh, is a mitzvah, but he and this is cited by the Binyan Sion. But the 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 Ramon doesn't say as a halakha that uh, you should teach your son uh, umnos. Now, why not? I don't know of any real good explanation for it. It's one of these things that no one's been able to come up with a good explanation. The the Rav Chaim Azar Shapiro, the uh, Minchas Alazar, in his Divrei Torah, Part Eight, uh, Number Eighteen, says that the Rambam was doing this with his great chachma, because he knew that if he made a halacha, that you have to teach your son of trade, this would lead people to open up um, uh, trade schools, and um, they, they would lead then young people to put the focus more on secular studies than Torah studies. I mean, he has a whole thing here about this. That's clearly not shot in the Rambam, but uh, that's what he says. Incidentally, also, when uh, this, this is the Chabad translation, 
they translate uh, Chachma as secular knowledge. That's not what Chachma means. It doesn't mean secular knowledge. It means uh, it means um, philosophy or uh, well, what the Rambam refers to at the end of chapter four of Yisodia Torah, physics and metaphysics, philosophy, because that's part of Torah. At least that's what I think. And I think that's what the general understanding of Chachma is. It's definitely not secular studies. It's these um, areas of... Um, learning, which um, are important to philosophy. But I have to say, that that's not what Rabbi Rabinovich in his um, Yad Peshutta says. He understands Chachma here to mean uh, Midot, that uh, the, there's a synonym. And um, he, he brings an example, which he thinks a proof of this. So that's when the really should be translated as just like Deot, Hilchot Deot, what is, it really means Midot. Uh, that's um, what he thinks it means. But um, Okay, and the final thing I want to tell you, oh, second to final thing, I thought, I think you find it, with regard to the abortion, I think some of you will find this cute, because uh, an article uh, from um, the Volok Conspiracy, but I, I think it appeared in Reason Magazine, actually, this professor, he's happens to be Jewish in Texas, wrote a very um, interesting article uh, a synagogue in Palm Beach, Florida, challenged the constitutionality of the abortion restrictions, the new abortion restriction in Florida, and they claim that it uh, violates Jewish law. So what Professor Blackman makes the claim, he wants to know whether this can be treated at all seriously, because reform doesn't accept Jewish law. And if you don't keep kosher and you don't keep Shabbos, his argument is it's very difficult to claim that uh, the abortion law is put in make, is, is placing a religious burden upon you because by definition, reform doesn't accept Jewish law. So how could you accept Jewish law just in this one case to make the argument? And uh, uh, any of our lawyers here, you might find this of interest. And finally, the last thing I want to mention, otherwise I could stay all night, is uh, I have to make a, a, a little bit of a correction on something um, about Shira Shiri. I was right, but not exactly. Uh, um, I mentioned Raphael Breuer. Raphael Breuer, he wrote a commentary on Shira Shiri that he took it literally, and that's true. And then I started waxing eloquent about how, especially in today's day and age, this is something we, it's very nice to look at Shira Shirim, love, etc. Actually, what I was uh, channeling wasn't Yaakov Barth, uh, as I'll explain in a minute, well, sorry, wasn't um, not Yaakov Barth, wasn't uh, Rafael Breuer, it was actually Yaakov Barth. Yaakov Barth, the son of Israel Hildesheimer, he also writes about Shira Shirim, and he speaks about the allegorical interpretation. But he also speaks about everything I just mentioned about how um, it's hava um, you know, the marriage and love. Uh, this is uh, their bitoy him and uh, we, you know, it's it, all about positive. So I mentioned this because Rafael Breuer actually has a different play on it. He he takes it literally also as an important meaning. However, he sees the the significance of the literalness in that, contrary to Yaakov Barth, who I said was the son-in-law of Israel Hildesheimer, taught at the Rabbinical Seminary of Berlin, a great, great scholar. Um, Rafael Breuer sees it as teaching you halachot, what not to do. He reads Shira Shirim as a message how not to, the exact opposite of Bart, how a love that is not sneostic, that Shira Shirim is telling you how not to express love. Uh, so it's literal, but it's actually, um, it's expressing it, you're supposed to learn the halachot, how our love has to be more sneostic. So it's a very interesting reading. And those who want to learn about Shira Shirim, I recommend this volume, obviously, the... Um, the Das Mikra, because really in total opposition to Art Scroll, which Art Scroll says that the Art Scroll, the language is that it says that the literal meaning is so wrong, that it is so incorrect that it's not even a possible meaning. It's absolutely incorrect. If you look in the, um, and this is comes right out of, you know, the center of religious Zionism, uh, two of the uh, editors are, um, from Mordechai Breuer of Shal Yisraeli, the great post it explains, this is an introduction of Amos Chacham, 
obviously there's an allegorical interpretation, but there's also the literal interpretation, and uh, they, they he affirms it for the very same reasons the Yaakov Bart. That uh, we shouldn't be ashamed. So everything I was um, transmitting is it comes from good sources. It's just not from Rafael Breuer, because although he sees it as literal, he thinks the stress is actually on the bad sort of love. By the way, the uh, the old question of why was it originally written? And uh, many people suggest that it was originally written as a um, as uh, like songs at a, a wedding feast. Uh, this is actually stated explicitly in the introduction here on page uh, six of the uh, of the Das Mikra. And look at the and he cites uh, the beginning of uh, chapter five, where it says, uh, "I am coming to my garden, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice, etc." Et so look at the end of the pasuk: "Eat, O friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O beloved." It's clearly. Uh, the stage here is clearly uh, at a feast, a wedding feast. So, uh, so the, the whole message in the um, Das Mikra is that both interpretations are correct, uh, that you have the allegorical, but the Peshat is also a value, and that's why it's written that way. Uh, um, obviously in total opposition to the art school approach, but uh, the last I looked, the art school didn't bind any of us. Uh, so uh, we, I don't think we need to be concerned uh, with that. Okay, my friends, I want to now return for the rest of today and uh, pick up with Abraham Geiger, who's, who's taught us all sorts of interesting things. And uh, so let's continue. Like I said, we'll need another, I think, maybe after today, two more classes to finish with him. And then, then I'm not sure. Then I, I could go into the orthodox response to reform, the whole you know, Hirsch... Um, Bamberger dispute, but I also have classes on Bamberger, so I can put it in that, uh, or I can move in, maybe I'll move into Zachary Franco and positive historical Judaism that I, I find really interesting myself. Maybe that's what we'll do. Uh, that's sort of quasi-reform in a certain uh, way. Uh, uh, okay, so what were some of Geiger's other ideas? Uh, well, first of all, he begins with the assumption that the traditional notion of revelation is just not tenable today. And uh, it's irrelevant. There's, the laws are irrational. They don't speak to modern people. Um, and uh, as we've already seen, one of the ikarim for Geiger is if it doesn't touch you spiritually anymore, like taking a lulav doesn't touch us anymore, then it doesn't need to be preserved. For Geiger, reform is dafka, the path that will preserve uh, Jews and will keep Jews in Judaism. And it's a little hard to argue with this when you think about it, because... Um, and we remember we spoke about reform as a form of Kirov. With all these Jews who were dropping out, if there wasn't reform in Germany, they would have just completely assimilated because they weren't going to be Orthodox. So this gave them something. Now, true, it only kept them Jewish maybe for another generation or two. But then Geiger obviously didn't want that. He wanted it to continue, but uh, it did. And it kept them. And the same thing uh, in America. I, I think you'd have to be blind not to see this. In fact, if you look in uh, Rabbi Sabato's conversations with Ravar Lichtenstein, Ravar Lichtenstein says explicitly, at the end of the day, and any, any uh, form of Judaism that keeps Jews attached is better than nothing, which is the exact opposite, which I was told from Rabbi Sarna of the Chevron Yeshiva. That, no, we'd rather have them secular than have them with a distorted form of uh, Judaism. But uh, it is true that in America, reform and uh, conservative, obviously, but reform also kept Jews uh, connected. It kept them from marrying non-Jews for a couple of generations. And then when they started marrying non-Jews, it kept them, uh, it at least kept them connected to uh, the Jewish people, to Israel. Uh, it held them in the broader fold. The problem today is half the Reformed Jews are not halakhically Jewish. So it's hard to know what to do with them. Uh, we even have rabbis who aren't Jewish, but uh, at least it's better to have them in our fold supportive, at least we hope supportive, of Israel, of the Jewish people, uh, than to be totally lost, assimilated, gone forever. Because at least if they're Jewish, uh, we can connect to them. And uh, But uh, look, we have to be realistic. It's only uh, reform hasn't been successful. If successful means keeping them uh, you know, for multiple generations. But uh, in a sense, it did keep them for a few generations. So I guess if, 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 if everything gets credit, uh, so... Uh, you have to give them uh, some credit for that. I say this because I don't think you had traditional Jews being enticed and leaving traditional Judaism to become reform. They left traditional Judaism, and then the choice was, 
Do you at least belong to a temple that you go to occasionally and give your kids a bar mitzvah and have some connection? Or do you totally assimilate? I don't think there's any question that in the West, the, the latter option where total assimilation would have been what happens. And you see this with Israelis who come to America. You know, they're, uh, they obviously have no connection to uh, Reform Judaism, and they just, uh, they, many of them just uh, completely assimilate. So uh, I guess we have to judge them in that sense uh, favorably to a certain extent. Uh, so what, though, is, uh, because, again, these were the people, that when I say this, I understand, during the context of the dispute, of course you couldn't. But in retrospect, these were people who uh, had given up on Torah, and yet they refused to convert. There still were restrictions, and there still was um, prejudice, and there still were things that a Jew could not become in Germany in the mid-19th century. It would have been so easy, and so many of them did convert to Christianity. And then everything's open for them. Uh, we all know about all the examples of this. However, the Reformed Jews, they still had this Jewish pride, and they still were willing to put up with the various uh, forms of um, second-class status and uh, discrimination. Uh, so you have to, there's something to be said for that. Just like uh, Rav Cook would look at, and others would look at the early Zionists who didn't observe anything and were opposed to observance. The fact though, that they had this, uh, this segula, Rav Cook called it, and they were willing to sacrifice for the Jewish people and go to the land of Israel. You have to, if you're honest, you have to say about the reformed Jews that they were willing to suffer to be Jewish. And their children usually weren't, or their grandchildren, but uh, there were people there who uh, were willing to sacrifice for in their mind what Judaism meant. So I think you have to give credit in that respect. So what, for Geiger then, what is Judaism? If it's not revelation, uh, the way we think about it, well, it's the eternal truths he spoke about, which are really based on reason. It's an idea, as we already saw this, it's in Mendelssohn, but this is also the core of Judaism, universal truths based on reason. And these truths, so the Jewish people have expounded upon them. So for instance, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments and the moral law, and God, God is there. He's not an atheist. God inspires us as we reach out for these eternal truths. But the truths are eternal and they're universal. They apply to everyone. But we, because we had this connection to God, and that we not not that God spoke to us, but that uh, we we felt a sense of spirituality, a sense of an existence of God, and through the use of our reason, we were able before others. This is going to be part of the idea of the, the mission of ethical monotheism to come up with important ideas that any civilized society needs. Uh, now, there is going to be a tension here between the stress on reason and revelation, because although Geiger puts a stress on reason, um, there were many reform leaders who actually believed in the revelation of the Torah. There were plenty of reform leaders who, in contrast to Geiger, were complete believers that the Torah was revealed in its entirety. However, they believe that uh, within the Torah, it was also um, understood that the laws are not eternal. They only apply in an era where like we saw when you live among idolaters and pagans, that the Torah itself doesn't wish for you to keep the, the ceremonial, the ritual law. But they believe the moral law was um, a product of her divine revelation, so much so that Isaac Mayer Wise refused to hire Louis Ginsburg to teach in, in Cincinnati at the Hebrew Union College because he suspected that Louis Ginsburg was an adherent to the higher criticism, and Isaac Mayer Wise, the reform leader, believed in Torah in its entirety. Uh, for Geiger, the outer core is obviously this, what we call the ceremonial laws, and uh, but none of this is eternal. It was valuable. It had its place, but we've moved beyond it. Very different than Mendelssohn. As we saw from Mendelssohn, the ritual laws are eternal. They're binding. You can never get rid of them. Uh, for Geiger, you know what's binding? The moral law is binding. It, it, for, in Geiger's day, you everyone knew what the moral law was. As we've seen in recent years, what used to be thought to be moral, today immoral, today is often regarded as not immoral. So even basic morality, we have new understandings. But for Geiger, they hadn't yet reached that point. So the moral law is binding. The ceremonial law is made by people, and it can change over time. It's based on customs and traditions. If they remain meaningful, fine. If they're not meaningful, no. Um, so now we know what's eternal and what's not eternal. And we also see that what determines, what's the arbiter? It's human reason. It's conscience. 
But this doesn't mean that uh, everything is reason. No, I would say that, remember, Judaism is a religion. It's not just, uh, you know, some sort of Aristotelian uh, understanding of how to live. And every generation is going to express itself in ways that are spiritual. But every generation has to find it. Every generation will find ceremonies that speak to them. So Geiger is not saying get rid of ceremonies. Rather, we find ceremonies that speak to us. And every generation will find it. But the job of the ceremonies is simply to give us religious inspiration. But they're, 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 they're like the kernel. They can be changed. It is true that there were some reformers, even proto-reformers, who were almost carrots in that they wanted to get rid of the Talmud, rabbinic. They wanted to go back just to the Bible. But this is not Ge Geiger's way. Geiger saw the, um, the Talmud as another stage in the development of Judaism. The rabbinic period is an important stage. And it's an authentic stage. But we've moved beyond it. And... Uh, and Ian Geiger speaks about how in our contemporary strivings, we will listen to the voices of the ancients and to discover the genuine Jewish spirit in the Talmud. But the point is that there's a spirit in the Bible, then there's a spirit in the Talmud. Every generation moves on. What is the essence, though, of Judaism, if you can point to an essence for Geiger? And Geiger points to the prophets. If you want to know what the essence is, in, in a spiritual sense, we know, as I said, the Ten Commandments, the uh, um, things like that. But if you want to see how it plays out in action, look to the prophets. The prophets for Geiger, they recognize that the, the rituals were secondary. And there's all sorts of psukim where the prophets speak about, uh, the prophets say, you know, you weren't commanded on sacrifice. Hard to know what they mean. Of course, what do you mean you weren't commanded? The Torah is full of these commandments. So it seems to be that they're saying that uh, these are not the essential commands, the most important commands. So for Geiger, if you look at the prophets, what do they have? They have concern for the poor, concern for the widow, concern for the orphan, uh, the rituals that have outlived their usefulness, that stand in opposition uh, to true spirituality. They can uh, jettison them. Uh, um, today, we call this social justice. Um, and they believed in God. They believed in the one God, obviously, and they believed in a bright future for humanity. We're moving to a better place. Geiger could point to the fact that 19th century Germany was more civilized and more advanced than medieval times. Obviously, that was the case. Uh, and the source of the ideals of the prophets is God. Because they were inspired by God to search and to come up with these ideas. Uh, so therefore, Geiger sees value in rituals if they add meaning. And he kept kosher. It might surprise you, Geiger kept kosher. Does that mean that he was makhpid on uh, you know, all the things? No, but uh, he would not eat pork, things like that. He was, because it had value. It gave spirituality to our lives. It added holiness to our lives. On the other hand, uh, because it's up to Geiger to decide what gives spirituality, he could also decide that circumcision was, quote, barbaric, a, a barbaric and bloody act. That's what he said, Geiger. Um, now, as I recall, he says this in a private email, a private letter. So I don't believe he ever publicly advocated getting rid of circumcision. Later, you'd have reform leaders who definitely got rid of circumcision. As far as I recall, he never publicly spoke about this, but privately thought it was a barbaric act. Uh, why is it barbaric? Because it's not a, um, in his mind, it's not a representation, I guess you could say, of the Jewish spirit. He didn't, he wouldn't fast on Tisha B'Av. Did he fast on Yom Kippur? As far as I know, he did. But we know he didn't fast on Tisha B'Av. He tells us he didn't fast. Because uh, today, for Geiger, we're not the mourning over the temple. On the contrary, history has shown that the destruction of the temple was a positive thing because it led to a different type of Judaism, a more advanced type of Judaism, one not focused on sacrifices in the temple. Uh, Geiger has often been criticized for uh, really being an advocate of this idea of Germans of a mosaic persuasion. Although, as far as I know, he never used that expression. And there is some truth to this. Um, during the 1840 Damascus affair, there was a, um, a Catholic um, monk or a friar uh, and his Muslim um, servant in Damascus who uh, were killed. And uh, the, um, the story was that... Uh, it was the Jews who did it uh, to take his, uh, to use the blood to make matzah. And um, Geiger didn't get involved with this. He said that, um, in fact, hold on a second, I just want to. Um, there's a, um, 
I saw something interesting before on this. Um, yeah, um, actually, they, they they disappeared. That it's um, I don't know if they ever found them again. Uh, they, they they disappeared. So of course, you know, whenever uh, uh, people disappeared, it was the Jews. Uh, uh, even though this is a European thing, uh, the blood libel, there was a French uh, consul, I believe, not the ambassador, the consul he was called, who was pushing this, but uh, it created a big uh, problem where uh, the Jews were blamed for this. And Geiger didn't get involved. Geiger said that um, I'm involved in Jewish spiritual and intellectual development, but when it comes to physical, you know, the, the, this is a human problem. That the Jews are being oppressed there. This is I. I relate to them like I relate to any humans who are being oppressed. Uh, there's nothing specifically Jewish about it. It's a Geiger's really an early example of uh, this um, this progressive attitude that uh, we see today. We speak of progressive, where uh, you don't want to have any particularism, and that the God forbid that you'd. Uh, be more concerned about Jews than anyone else, because then that shows that you're particularistic and you're a nation, and uh, we can't have that. Uh, uh, although it needs also to be said that the later in life, um, when Jews were being persecuted uh, in Romania, he did try to get the Prussian government to intervene. So uh, this viewpoint of his is not, I guess, uh, uh, a consistent one, but if you read his essay on or his letter explaining why he doesn't intervene or why he doesn't want to intervene in the Damascus affair, it's really I, I even have it here. It's uh, it's really pathetic. Uh, um, he says that which goes on among the Jews living in the uncivilized country is of trifling importance. Um, he says the only thing that interests him. It, the universal Jewish concern is uh, the upper stratum of the Jews. There's those those Jews who are uh, advanced intellectually and spiritually. So it's really uh, it's a reflection. It's no different, I think, than how the the German Jews related to many of the East European Jews as well. That uh, they looked at them almost as a different species. Um, he said it's a good humanitarian deed to take up the cause, but it's not a Jewish problem uh, per se. Uh, Nevertheless, I think in conclusion, if I, about this, you have to say that he was a proud Jew, because like I said, um, in his own way, he didn't believe in reform to gain equality. He didn't, he, he thought equality would come, but he didn't, uh, it, that's not what it was about. Uh, and he also didn't believe in a radical break with tradition that so many other reformers wanted it. Uh, and he, he was honest enough to acknowledge that Judaism is still developing. And uh, it's hard to know where in the end it would uh, end up. He supported reform, obviously, but it had to be historical and not revolution. He thought whole time was engaged in revolution uh, and he wasn't. So uh, really when you look at reformers, uh, Geiger is not the most radical. On the contrary, in fact, earlier he, at first he thought that the rabbis could push, uh, I saw this in Michael Meyer, that the rabbis could push the reform, but later he sort of backed off and said that uh, the people will push the reform and the rabbis go along with it. Uh, Okay, so now let me ask a question. Geiger's a proud Jew, but what's valuable about being Jewish? Why be Jewish? What does Jew Judaism add to the 19th century in Germany? Such an advanced culture, advanced Protestant culture, great philosophers, uh, and why why should it be viewed then as equal to um, Christianity in, in German society? What do we even need it for? Uh, well, Geiger answered, and he's not the only one. The early reformers answer all the early reformers answer this question. And they coined this expression, which we know in English as the mission of Israel. And now, what does it mean, mission of Israel? Mission it has nothing to do with Jews being missionaries, like uh, going out and converting people. We have not done that in a long, long time. Although if you look in the New Testament, there's a passage there that uh, speaks about Jews um, uh, loving to get converts. And we know about this Herod, Herod's uh, for. Is it forefathers, uh, his grandparents, or great grandparents? I forget now. Uh, were um, forcibly converted, so there have been times that Jews were interested in uh, in converts, but that's not what it means. Uh, um, the mission of Israel, as Geiger and other Reform leaders see it, is that Jews have a mission to disseminate the moral teachings of Judaism to the rest of the world, not by converting them, but by bringing them in their own religions to knowledge of these doctrines that we Jews possess. We have them. 
uh, all the doctrines that you'll see in the Ten Commandments and uh, doctrines about how helping the poor and the widow, all these things, doctrines of a pure God. This is going to be one of the issues because uh, they do believe in a pure idea of God. So Jesus is going to be a problem. So although they don't want to rock the boat, the reform leaders understand that um, there still is something important that Judaism could give to the West, namely a more pure idea of Judaism, because men like Geiger obviously rejected the idea that God assumed human form in Jesus. Uh, so we Jews, although we're small, we're a minority, we're going to teach you that's our mission. And we're going we're gonna to teach you not just through doctrines, but through our life. We live a moral life. Jews are not involved in war. Jews are involved in, uh, in immorality, much less than everyone else. We've preserved a moral, pure way of life. And, therefore, and we're going to model it for the world. Sound um, ethnocentric? It was. And believe it or not, that's the reason why, of all the reform doctrines, today reform Jews, this is the one they want nothing to do with. Because can you imagine reform Jews today speak about the mission of Israel? That, that makes it seem like we're better than other people or that we have something special. No, no, that's, that's going to be something that modern reformers don't want. Uh, and but for people like Geiger, we are going to, through modeling this, through the mission of Israel, we will help bring the world, the nations of the world, to the Messianic era. Now, what's the Messianic era? The Messianic era has nothing to do with, uh, you know, prophets or supernatural interventions or anything like that. The Messianic era, or, or a personal Messiah, for that matter, the Messianic era is an era when the world, like Isaiah says, uh, there's no more war when people respect one another, when they live in peace. That is the messianic era. That's what God wants. Uh, earlier generations couldn't appreciate this. They could only imagine a time, because they were living with pagans and barbarians, they could only imagine a time when they'd have to leave these pag pagans and barbarians and make their way from the four corners of the earth to the land of Israel, where they could create a moral society. And that's why they imagine this messianic vision of return to Israel and building the temple. But today, we live among civilized people, uh, dignified people. So therefore, we have no desire, and God doesn't have a desire for us to return to the land of Israel and start worshiping in an old-fashioned way. No, the messianic era will take place in every civilized society, and that's what God wants. So it's monotheism, it's personal morality, and then and it's joined even early on with what we would call social justice. And this the social, although the ethical monotheism has been jettisoned from Reform Judaism today because it seems too ethnocentric uh, and too uh, haughty, I guess, uh, that makes us too special. Social justice not only has it not been jettisoned, social justice for Reform Judaism became the central feature of Reform Judaism, uh, um, where everyone is called to... Um, help improve social welfare of society. It's a hallmark. It's a defining characteristic today. Uh, they term it tikkun olam. Tikkun olam, it's only really from the 1960s that tikkun olam comes to mean uh, social justice. Uh, tikkun olam has Lurianic connotations and uh, uh, if you go back to the Talmud, you can have a similar type expressions that talk about, you know, making good decrees so that the society functions. But tikkun olam, in the sense, it's a great expression. And I don't know who was the first to coin it, uh, but I believe it's from the 60s, certainly not in the 50s. Uh, but the, although, I mean, in the 50s, you had people speaking about civil rights, things like that. So you had this notion. Look, if you get rid of um, Jewish law, if you don't have halacha, you need to fill it with something else. So what do you fill it with? You fill it with um, something which is part and parcel of, of Judaism, social justice. I hate to say it, but if you start reading passages today from Isaiah, people think you're a Reformed Jew. You go into an Orthodox room, you start doing it, then I think you're a Reformed Jew. But that's because the Orthodox have forgotten a large measure, just like the Reformed forgot a large measure. So the Orthodox have only been focused on halacha, and the Reformed, they don't have halacha, so they focus on uh, Isaiah. But the truth is that they both are necessary, and they're both are vital in Isaiah himself kept halacha. So you can't get rid of them. Um, you can't jettison it. If you look in, um, take a look in um, in Vayikra, in uh, chapter uh, was 18, 19, I forget which one it is, where you get the, the important psukim, the uh, haftal yacha kamocha, and just weights and measures, and caring about the, you know, the poor people and all that. Right next to that, you have things dealing with uh, no tattoos and shaving with a razor and there's sexual crimes. In other words, the ritual and the um, 
the social and the moral, we combine them. They're all together. And you see that very clearly in that chapter. I think it's chapter 19 of Vayikra. Unlike what the reform said, and unlike what the Christians said, that you have to divide their ceremonial, the ritual, the ritual is only temporary, it's not eternal, so that we can get rid of, but we still keep hold on to the moral, but you see that the ritual and the moral are intertwined, and uh, you can't have uh, one without the other, uh, but it is, it did become a hallmark of the, of the movement, the reform movement of social justice, and even there's a center for social action, and it was directed by David Saperstein, uh, if he, I don't know if he's retired yet, but uh, I mean, the movement is committed to um, liberalish liberalism. Today, I don't even know if you call it liberalism because it's not classical liberalism. They call it progressivism, uh, separation of church and state as well. But uh, you know, all these social justice things. In fact, uh, Jacob Patachowski comes from good Orthodox background, but was a leading uh, reform thinker. He even wrote a very good book called Prayer Book Reform in Europe. And he has an article, a, a special article devoted to, it's called Karite Tendencies in Early Reform, because you had some of these early reform leaders who were so anti-rabbinic that uh, they almost became Karites. Um, but he, he wrote in one of his last essays during the Judge Bork uh, conference, let me see here if I can... Um, quickly. So uh, I never met uh, Patachowski. Uh, I always wanted to. Uh, he dies in uh, 1991. So um, that was, um, um, yeah, so it was the 1980s. It was under Reagan that uh, Justice Bork, Judge Bork, uh, was, uh, they nominated him. Uh, um, am I right about that? Um, was um yeah it was definitely it was a, a judge it was president reagan so uh uh petachowski wrote an essay in which he said he walked into a reform synagogue <laughs> he was a leading reform uh thinker and he says right as he walked in on the right there was petitions there uh to send to your uh, senator to oppose uh judge bork uh being raised to the supreme court and he concluded from that that Reform Judaism had failed because uh, it had become liberalism with a Jewish flavor. And as an old Reform Jew, uh, Petachowski's point was that it's fine to be liberal, but uh, Reform Judaism can't just be a, a branch of the Democratic Party, that it has to be Judaism. And, uh, you know, Republicans also have to be welcome in Reform Judaism. Um, uh, Let me uh, I, I, let me make another point before I go on. Um, incidentally, I don't you know it's it's tough sometimes. I think for a conservative with a small C Jew to be reformed because the movement itself is so tied to uh, social justice. And uh, but it's not just the reform movement. We see this um, in the world at large as well. And I, um, for example, I'll take wokeism for instance. Um, anti-racism, all these movements you have here, people need something. They need something to guide them. They need some purpose in life. If you don't have traditional religion, you need to fill it with something to give your life meaning. So there's been a, a lot, Andrew Sullivan, and, uh, with John McWhorter has a whole book on this. Uh, hold on a second. I'll, um, I'll show you uh, in which um, he makes this case. He calls it woke racism, how a new religion has betrayed um, Black America. But his point is that wokeism and social justice, that these are religions. And there's a lot of truth, I think, to this. That, um, well, In fact, he has this, let me, I'll just play you something here. Um, hold on. Because I think what you see in Reform Judaism, how social justice became the religion, as they were lacking in traditional religion, you see this in the world at large in um, in wokeism and uh, progressivism that it's become their own religion. And one of the early um, people to speak about this, although he focuses more on anti-racism, not on wokeism as a whole, uh, but was uh, John McWhorter. And I'll just play you just uh, two minutes of what he has to say because it's very relevant, I think. Um, What's the issue here? Why in the world would I say that anti-racism is a problem? Because of course, no, it's not a problem to not be a racist. And I don't think any of us would be here if we thought the debate was over that. So of course, you don't want to be a racist. 
racism is bad. We, we, we know that. But what about the more complex and therefore more interesting issues? And one issue is that anti-racism as currently configured has gone a long way from what used to be considered intelligent and sincere civil rights activism. Today, it's a religion, and I don't mean that as a rhetorical feint. I mean that it actually is what any naive anthropologist would recognize as a faith in people, many of whom don't think of themselves as religious, but Galileo would recognize them quite easily. And so, for example, the idea that the responsible white person is supposed to attest to their white privilege and realize that it can never go away and feel eternally guilty about it, that's original sin right there. The idea that there is going to be a day when America comes to terms with race, or that there could be, what does that even mean? What is the meaning of the coming to terms? What would that consist of? Who would come to them? What would the terms be? At what date would this be? The only reason that anybody says that is because it corresponds to our conception of Judgment Day, and it's equally abstract. When we use the word problematic, especially since about 2008 or 9, what we're really saying is blasphemous. It's really the exact same term. And you can go on and on and listen, and there's been a lot written about how what we see today in social justice movements, it's really a religion. And I think uh, if you look at how Reform Judaism develops, uh, you see the exact same phenomenon that um, when you remove what is traditionally the basis of religion, rituals joined together, uh, that is, the Jewish religion that is, obligations, there's no more obligation. So what then makes it a religion? You have to substitute it with something else. And uh, it has been social justice. But before ending, I think I do need to conclude that um, there has been a return, of course, in more recent years to traditional religion, even in Reform Judaism. Um, and that's a big difference between Geiger's era and today. So, for instance, uh, it's been at least the last 20 years or even more, 30 years, an appreciation in Reform Judaism that ritual is valuable. And it's important to emotion, the emotional part of Judaism. The early reformers wanted to get rid of much of ritual. Contemporary Reform Judaism brought it back. There's a return to ritual, such as celebrating the Sabbath. Is that the same way we celebrate it? No. But it's, it's a recognition of it. Lighting candles, um, blessing the wine. You have Reform Jews who speak in terms of this. Wearing a kippah. You know how many Reform rabbis wear a kippah? There's also a relationship to Hebrew in Reform Judaism today that you didn't have in old reform. You have more and more Hebrew introduced to the service. Many Reform synagogues have now head coverings will be an option, <laughs> as opposed to telling you to take it off. Reform Judaism um, used to be totally committed to the diaspora. But now Reform Judaism, that at least official Reform Judaism, is supportive of Zionism in the state of Israel. And of course, we said Reform Jews uh, today will not speak about the mission of Israel uh, because uh, it's not universalist enough. What I'm going to do when we come back is uh, there's a few things I still want to do. I want to deal with, first of all, the rabbinic conferences. There was a number of Reform rabbinic conferences, and they passed wide ranging legislation designed to change the religion. And this was important because you had rabbis who then after these conferences would go back to their small towns. And what do the people in the small towns know? The rabbis would tell them that the rabbinic conference decided you don't need to do this or that. But we'll speak about some of the issues. Yom Tov Sheni becomes an issue. Hebrew in the services, moving the Shabbos. So we'll talk about some of that. And uh, I also want to tell you as well about uh, the, the famous murder of the reform rabbi. At least it used to be famous. Most people don't know about it. And uh, what can we say? Are the Orthodox guilty of this murder? Uh, or at least uh, as has been alleged, turns out it's, I think it's a canard, but uh, there was a reform rabbi who was murdered. And then uh, uh, some more things with Geiger. And really we're coming to the end, so, but uh, it's already, it's 924 and I don't want to start with that. And I said a lot. So uh, let's um, take the questions and comments and uh, finish up for today. And then I will see you, God willing, in another couple months. And I'll miss you all because I have fun. And I enjoy uh, our conversations. So uh, 
Yes. So uh, David says that uh, many Mazus was a, served as Attorney General. Uh, he served as Supreme Court Justice and then Attorney General. And uh, Mesh Eisen says, no, he is not observant. He's considered to be hostile to the views of the Gutti. That's what I read, but I didn't want to, uh, you know, because I, I read the, it in a, in, you know, a Haredi source. So uh, they say that about Bennett also. So, uh, so I wasn't sure, but I, uh, I, I'm glad to see that I was correct. So, um, that in my assumption, at least, that uh, um, he had left the path. Um, Jacob says that almost all Sephardic congregations in America recite Mincha and Arvit uh, before sunset. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, that, and that's the, but of course, Ashkenazim could do it also, but it's not so difficult for us. It's like we can have Mincha at 8.15 and then Davin. It's not such a problem. But believe me, we'd be doing this, uh, we would be doing this if we had sunset at uh, 10 o'clock. And it's not a leniency. It's explicit in the Mishnah Berur, the Arach HaShulchan, that you do this. And this also has relevance to um, the holidays. Uh, so, for instance, Shavuos. We're very careful, at least in the Ashkenazim in America. We want it to be, uh, we have to finish. We can't start Shavuos until we finish the, the day. This is a relatively few hundred years ago thing. In, in Europe, uh, they never they always started Shavuos early. And uh, if you go to a place like England or other places where uh, if you, you'd have to wait to Dolphin at 10 p.m., they, they go back, to, many of them go back to the old way of doing it. Um, but I just gave it as an example of something that hit me as I'm davening there that, uh, and how I'm always challenged every time at a baseball game, I would want to do this, that uh, it's only because people live in a place where their minion, their Ashkenazic minion, always waits till sunset, except for everyone knows Friday, you can start early. Uh, M.H. Lazerson says, also in Italy, Mincha Meyer, Verdavim before sundown, the same practice among B'nai Roma and Sephardim. Um, also, I, for Shiva Minyanim, uh, you could do it. You can do it. If that's when you think you get dominion. In fact, it goes the other way as well. Uh, <laughs> you can dive in my riv, uh, even before um, uh, early in the day, early in the day, uh, two, three hours before uh, uh, darkness. Um, again, if you do, if you minion, that's when you uh, need to do it. We did this during COVID. Rav Shechter told us we can dive in Mincha and then dive in my riv, even though uh, it's you know, bright light out, and we got a few hours till Shabbos ends, uh, because we couldn't get people to come back to, to Davin Meirev. You just had to know not to, um, uh, not to violate Shabbos, so you say Havdoah. Um, so then it says, Blackman has been duly rebutted. I, I saw it in the, uh, in the forward, but uh, yeah, I'm not getting into the legal things. I just think it's an interesting argument that, uh, his argument that people who don't feel bound on principle to Jewish law then making a claim that a law is um, is uh, restricting their religious freedom, and uh, um, that I, I found found that to be a very uh, provocative argument. Uh, and and Lazerson says that reform's acceptance of patriarchal sense represents a fundamental rupture with Judaism. Obviously, uh, that's correct. Uh, um, and yes, you're right that today you have uh, many reform. Many in the reform movement who are at odds with Israel and are more progressive than they are uh, Jewish. Uh, and then you say that the reform movement under Rabbi Stephen Wise also suppressed dissent in the Jewish community to FDR's refusal. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, look, no one's, um, uh, they've made mistakes, uh, no question about it. Um, um, Uh, Nissan says, uh, Yagor Itcha Ger does appear in Shemot in our Masoretic text. It does, but that, that that's, um, oh, I see what you're saying. So this may have been often on their lips, resulting in the non Masoretic version of the verse. Ah, okay, interesting, interesting point there. Uh, and then you, you give some other examples of uh, where you have things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, Lepad says, didn't the Orthodox rabbis who appealed to H. Morgenthau to appeal to Roosevelt by bombing train tracks also advocate that Jews should, uh, I guess, enter politics, cabinet, important posts in government, et cetera? Um, you're, is, I don't know, by the way, if the Orthodox rabbis appealed about bombing the train tracks. So what you're speaking about, and I showed the video, is that they had the march on Washington, the big march with the rabbis and uh, Morgenthau himself Wait, but they, they said that the people should 
Jews should not enter politics. Not but when it suited that. them, they, they appealed to a Jew who did enter politics. Okay, well, I, mean, I guess the reason for not entering is maybe because it couldn't be uh, halakhically observant. I'm not sure. But uh, um, I heard from um, Rabbi Soloveitchik, and when we drove him once, he said as follows, that uh, I told I told him about how um, this would have been 1984 uh, at the, I think it was the Republican National Convention for by Fabian Schoenfeld gave the um, address, the benediction or one of the benedictions. Everyone says that Sali Soloveitchik, Mayor Soloveitchik is the first one. Fabian Schoenfeld did. So I told this to Rabbi Soloveitchik and he said, he thought it was an unbelievable thing. And he knew Schoenfeld very well. He said that when he first came to Boston, that uh, when the um, politicians, when they needed to uh, speak to politicians, the Orthodox rabbis would have to go to the Reform rabbis because the Orthodox rabbis didn't even speak English. And uh, that he said, so he said they have to go to the Reform rabbis to be their intermediaries. Um, by the way, the, uh, the you know, you can make a claim that uh, this will, if you want to adopt the Hasim Sofer's approach and similar approach that you shouldn't enter politics because we're not supposed to take responsibility. We're not supposed to be involved. We're supposed to, we're in the Golas. We're not supposed to get involved in these matters. That And that was a traditional uh, traditional point of view for a long time. So I get it. Did uh, Yechiach Weinberg engage with Geiger's writings? Uh, he, he mentions him a couple of times just from a scholarly perspective. Uh, and then you say Yeshayahu's concept of being a light into the Goyim is still very central to the reform claim that Torah is only a moral guy, and of course, Tikkun Olam. Yes, but being a, it's not though that we teach them. We it's that we live in accordance with uh, you, you know the message, but not that we have something they don't have. As far as I know, they they don't use that language anymore. That uh, we have something to teach them, ethical monotheism. Um, and then you say probably Heschel popularized the Tikkun Olam trope. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, um, and Mike says the Ant Coulter has a book on the topic of liberal religion, the Church of Liberalism. Uh, by the way, if you know about progressivism, they have heresy also. Like any good religion, they have heresy. If you cross paths of the progressives, you're a heretic and they'll throw you out. You could be on that with them in every every single thing down the line, but if you happen, if you happen to be, let's say, pro-life, even if you're progressive 99% of the time, you're excommunicated, put in a room and thrown out of the progressive camp, 100%. Uh, uh, claim. Avaya says, do I think the extreme right in both religions shoot social justice as their own responsibilities instead of instead of placing them on Mashiach? It's a good point. Um, all I can say is that... Uh, we you, you, obviously we know when we've seen what the reformed Jews have thrown out, and uh, they've kept a little bit and they've thrown stuff out. Orthodox Jews, the fact is that they have thrown things out. They no longer focus on things that are also of value. Uh, there are aspects of social justice. It doesn't mean you have to adopt the progressive vision of it, but we need to. There's nothing wrong with us speaking the language of caring for the widow and the poor. We do do that, but for some reason we're afraid to speak the language because of uh, how it'll be seen. Uh, and um, I don't know, I don't think it's placing them on the Shiach. I just think it's that we're so focused on halacha that um, we uh, somehow uh, forget about uh, some of these things, I think. Uh, okay, so uh, we're very strict on halacha. This gives us something else to work on. Uh, iPad says, to borrow from Sholem, who believe there is the return of repressed desires regarding mysticism, repressed religious instincts, as many believe is a basic human desire, comes back in some other form. Yes. And Rabbi Shudnow says, Chicago Sinai observed all days, including Shabbat on Sunday, and they told you to remove your head covering when entering the sanctuary. Correct. But that those were always minorities and always, uh, always uh, very small. And finally, uh, Nat Lewin says that in pre-war Poland, very Orthodox rabbis who are Talmud Yechachamim, including his grandfather, Reich Sharov, and Romer Shapiro are very active in Polish politics. It's true that in Poland, the Aguda was active. They made a decision to be active, and they were involved. They were your, uh, your uh, father in his book, uh, he writes about, uh, gives an example, and your father was active in it. And, uh, and they, the Aguda always placed people, wanted people in parliament. 
And I always have wondered that, uh, was this in opposition to the Chassam Sofer? Because if you read the Chassam Sofer's description of how we're supposed to live in the Golas and how we're not supposed to get involved and we're supposed to, we're supposed to use uh, the, the Shtadlan and uh, it seems, I don't see how you can... Uh, Put the Aguda approach. Remember how much they were in Poland. They were a huge group, uh, and it was their interests. And they decided that uh, they have to be involved in politics. Uh, I don't see how that really works with the uh, the Chassam Sofer's uh, description. We'll do this when I come back next time, where he talks about uh, because I want to deal with the Chassam Sofer's response um, to emancipation, uh, the way he describes it. But uh, in America, it is the case that the Jews were very slow to get into Orthodox Jews to get into politics. They were, there were some, you had Congressman Tenzer and others, but uh, but now, of course, uh, you can even become president. Uh, uh, Lazen says, the grandfather of Merrick Garland's wife, was Sam Rosamond, was FDR's Jewish advisor. He counseled FDR to ignore the march of the rabbis and not meet them. He said they were like the grass that grows between the cracks of the sidewalk. Uh, Orthodox Jews didn't have much power then. And um, look, well, people like Stephen Wise, uh, they trusted Roosevelt. It's very easy for us to, in retrospect, knowing what happened, but the, he valued his friendship with them and um, they trusted him and uh, they, uh, they, they learned differently. Uh, but um, it, it's easy for us uh, to judge. Uh, uh, Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg in the movie, um, America and the Holocaust, the seed and indifference. His father was a Hasidic Sharav. He had a show in Baltimore. He says, he tells this story about his father, that one uh, Yom Kippur, his father said that if we had any Jewish pride, as soon as uh, Yom Kippur was over, we'd all go down to um, um, Washington, D.C. And I think he said, we'd chain ourselves uh, to the White House and we'd start screaming, you know, to do something to help the Jews in Europe. But he says, but the reason you're not going to do this is because your children are working in Washington, the New Deal administration, and you don't want to rock the boat. And um, that Motzei Yom Kippur, the uh, the board came to uh, Rabbi Hertzberg's father and Arthur Hertzberg's father and said that um, you're fired. So uh, a sense of the time. Um, Yes, Nissen says that Nat Lewin's grandfather was a member of the Guna Caucus in the parliament. His father was city councilman. If you look at Isaac Lewin's uh, Hebrew volume, he has a um, transcript there of, uh, take, of discussions in the city uh, council. And you could see that if this was 1933, 34, and you're predicting if there would be a Holocaust, you might predict it happening in Poland because the stuff that being said by elected members in Polish city councils, the anti-Semitism was unbelievable. Uh, yes, Nat says, obviously, it wasn't only the Aguda that was involved in politics. So the, the Alexander Hasidim, for instance, were not Aguda. You had Mizrahi. Everyone uh, was involved in Poland. Uh, uh, and finally, the last comment, uh, uh, Lazerson says that Madoff reveals conversations with the wise and FDR that displayed the latter's openly anti-Semitic attitudes, a great book that deserves a large audience, mostly ignored uh, by the mainstream press. To this, I would only say that uh, there was understood, I think, that there was an acceptable level of anti-Semitism in those days. Uh, Truman himself, Truman, with the, his Jewish buddy, the recon, recognized state of Israel. Now we know about his anti-Semitism. We know about anti-Semitic comments uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, it was expected that there'd be a certain level of that, but that's really neither here nor there. If, if the politicians did good by the Jews, and you, we spoke about Poland just a few minutes ago, the Aguda made deals with right-wing Catholic parties that were terribly anti-Semitic, the, that is that the ideology of the people was anti-Semitic. How could you, could you be not anti-Semitic if you were a pre-Vatican Catholic in Poland? Very difficult. But does it really matter and for the Aguda? No. If these politicians were uh, committed to ensuring the safety and autonomy of the Jewish community and their rights, the fact that in their personal life they might not have liked Jews. Uh, you know, that's neither here nor there. It's not important. Contrast that today, where if uh, a politician could be great for the Jews, but if then it comes up that we get a recording that in his, in his house 20 years ago, he said a negative thing about Jews, he's finished. But that wasn't always the case. Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon, he 
appoints Kissinger, he helps Israel. And we know he said anti-Semitic things that, uh, but you know, there's a private anti-Semitism and a public anti-Semitism. I thank you all very much for coming out tonight. Like I said, we'll pick up God willing in another two months. I'll be in Italy, hopefully next week with some of you. And, but in two months, we'll pick up. We'll just go a couple more classes, finish up with reform, really bring it to a close. And then I have to figure out, maybe we'll go into Zachary Frankel, the beginnings of conservative Judaism. But I really want to get into the Orthodox response to reform uh, in a political sense with Hirsch and Bamberger. So we'll have to figure out uh, what we will do. And the person who privately texts me in the Italian, I have to say that uh, at, at my sins, I uh, confess today that uh, my Italian, although I can understand a little reading it, uh, I certainly can't speak it like I, I know you do for having lived in Italy, but uh, I thank you for the kind words and uh, good night, everyone.